right. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be back with you. Very happy to be here, to be in this place, to be in this space uh, where we're worshiping today and teaching and praying. Also very happy to be wherever you are through the power of technology and by the power of the Holy Spirit to be in many different places and spaces at the same time. Let's open up with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you as we do every single week for the opportunity to gather together close to you and close to one another by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you would fill this room and fill our hearts. You would fill the room and the place and the space where everyone is worshiping today, that you would work through technology very powerfully indeed to bring us close to you and to close to each other. I pray that you would uh, come into our environment where we, wherever we are this morning, dear God, and give us an ability to focus on you, to put away the distractions, but to give you this time to worship you, to make whatever space, whatever place we're in, a holy place, a sanctuary, a place of worship. Bring us close to you. Bring our family close to you. Give us this ability to focus on you to the exclusion of anything else. Lord, I pray that if anybody is bringing any burdens with them this morning, you would give them, you would give us, you would give me the capacity to lay them down, to seek first the kingdom of God and all of its righteousness, whatever you're saying, whatever you're doing today, and know these things will be taken care of by you as well. We love you and we praise you. We can't wait to see what you're going to do in our time together today. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. I 
So, uh, as I said, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Monterey Church, at least in a very stripped-down form. My name is Pastor Brian, if you happen to be one of our guests today. This is the time in our gathering where we have the opportunity to worship God with our tithes and with our offerings. Um, this is our opportunity for members and regular attenders, those with a vested interest in the Monterey, Monterey Church, um, to invest in the kingdom of heaven through your tithes and through your offerings, through your financial gifts into the kingdom of heaven through God's church, his local church, Monterey Church. We know that scripture teaches us that giving in the church isn't so much giving as it is investing. And Paul, the apostle in 2 Corinthians, reminds us that if we sow generously, if we invest generously into the kingdom of heaven, then we will reap generously. I think this is a material um, reaping. For those who sow, we reap materially. But more importantly, it's a spiritual reaping. It pleases God. It's a way of worshiping him and bringing us closer to him. And it's a way of reaching people, bringing more people into the kingdom of heaven. The reason we're able to keep this church going right now in these uh, tough times is because people have made investments. We have a place, we have space, we have lights, we have cameras. We have the ability to be connected to the internet and, um, and all the equipment and everything associated with that. And that's because people have made investments uh, in this church through time and we were able to pivot and to put those uh, to use. We already know, in fact, that we're reaching more people through these broadcasts than we did any Sunday morning in a, in a building at Patriot High School. As large as the auditorium is there, we didn't fill that, but uh, we're reaching a lot of people through the internet. So thank you for your investment in the past, and thank you for continuing to be faithful as we move forward. A lot of you give online or by text, and we just thank you for continuing to be faithful with that. Those of you who typically leave contributions at the church when you come for the worship service, I would invite you to look at the button above the uh, sermon. There's a button there that you can give online. Or you can uh, simply give by mailing your check or your contribution to the church, and they're going to put that uh, address on the screen for you so that you have that as well. If you're a guest today, if you're simply tuning in or coming in through the internet for the first time or maybe the second time, we just simply want to invite you to be our guest. You don't have to um, make a contribution to enjoy the worship service today. We would love to know that you tuned in. We would love to know that you're out there. So if you can text us your text number so that we can keep you in the loop and give you information about the church or text or email us your email address, um, that would be great as well. So our text number and our email number will be on the screen there for you. And so please text us or email us your text or email so that we have you in the loop. Also, you can use that text number to send out questions, prayer requests, um, anything urgent you might need. And of course, you can email us anytime those types of requests uh, as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. Uh, we, again, we thank you for the opportunity you give us to participate in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, this is your kingdom, and you are powerful, and you are sovereign over all of it. Um, and you could certainly do what you want to do without us, but you give us the opportunity to participate with you. You don't close your kingdom, you open it. As a matter of fact, you opened it through your son, Jesus Christ, so that we might all come in and that we might all participate in the blessings and the abundance of the kingdom of heaven. At a time such as this, when so many things in our world seem so uncertain, the ability to exist under the covering and the protection of your kingdom is extraordinary. And I thank you and praise you that though things in this world seem so uncertain, things to you are so certain. And we have so many incredible promises given to us, not just for eternal life, but life on earth even before heaven. And I thank you and praise you that as you inspire us to give, not out of compulsion, not out of get, not guilt, not out of uh, the pastor, you know, making us feel guilty and give today. As we give because we're inspired and because we believe, these gifts will be a blessing to you because it shows that we love you, that we are grateful to you, and that we trust you. They're a blessing to us because they allow us to sow and to reap generously in the kingdom of heaven. And they're a blessing to so many others because they are used. This is the resources, the investment that you use um, to reach so many people with the gospel, with the truth 
uh, about your kingdom, about your son Jesus, and about so many other things. So thank you and praise you for the incredible opportunity we have today, even in a time such as this, through technology, to continue to participate in the kingdom of heaven uh, by worshiping you with our tithes and our offerings. Take these offerings, bless them and multiply them. Use them for great things in the kingdom and uh, to bless every single person that comes under the covering of this church. We love you and praise you. Amen.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do. We love you. We praise you. And again, we thank you for the opportunity we have to be with you today. Jesus, we do indeed um, desire for this to be all about you today, our worship to be all about you, not to be about us, not to be about me, uh, not to even be about the church so much as the leader of the church. Uh, Jesus, you yourself, your ministry, your word and what you desire and what you have for us. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be alive and well in this place, in this space, and upon me and in my heart. Uh, Anoint me to teach and to preach your word. I don't really care to be eloquent today, dear God, or preach in such a way as it makes me look good and lifts me up. I pray that I would preach in a way that is clear and understandable, that lifts your precious people up and brings them closer to you, and that lifts you up, that glorifies you. I pray also that your Holy Spirit would be in these many different places and spaces so that as people hear my voice, hear your word um, taught uh, and preached today, that they would have the capacity to hear it, to believe it, to understand it, and even know how to respond to it. I pray that you would take my words and you would make them perfect by the power of the Holy Spirit between my mouth and their precious ears. And I pray that you would even add words, dear God, that your voice would get involved in the communication and you would speak directly to the heart of your precious people. We ask for nothing less than this incredible miracle. And we know that we don't need to do this in a puffed up way. A humble way is just fine. But just clear, intelligible words that are powerful and authoritative, landing in the hearts of your people uh, and staying there, uh, being planted deeply so that they can produce the fruit that you desire for them. Lord, I pray that as I teach and preach today, you would draw your people close to you. And those that are hurting the most today, those in the greatest need, would find hope. And they would find peace and joy beyond all understanding. I pray, dear God, even as I teach and preach today, not necessarily on miracles, that you would do miracles anyway. As people seek you first through your word and the teaching today, that you would come into their life and come into their existence, that you would heal them physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, uh, relationally, and um, and, and, in any way, dear God, that they they may need you the most today. Uh, We don't want to forget that the people on the other side of this Um, have many needs, including the pastor here standing here today himself. And so meet our needs as we seek first your kingdom through this word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're continuing uh, the series today that we were in before all of this broke out, before the coronavirus thing broke out, and we've been off for a couple weeks doing some other subjects and some other teachings. Uh, But we're going back to Matthew chapter 6 this week, which is where we left off. If you want to look it up, it's Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Uh, If you don't want to look it up, then I think the scriptures will be on the screen, so they'll be right there for you to see. Uh, Jesus is actually not surprised by the current circumstances that we're in. God knew in advance. He knows all things in advance. He is sovereign over all things, and so he knew where we would be at such a time as this. And I believe that where we are in the Gospel of Matthew, and specifically in the Sermon on the Mount, And specifically in the preamble to or the teaching that precedes the teaching of how to pray through the Lord's Prayer is exactly where we're supposed to be. This is kind of our foreordained place to be because as we heard a couple weeks ago, our response as the church, as the people of God to this crisis, to this thing that we're going through is first and foremost to be spiritual. He's calling us to a spiritual response. We read from the Old Testament when the Lord spoke to Solomon, the king of Israel, and we believe that he's speaking to us through these same verses. He said that uh, when he uh, held up the rain in heaven so that the crops diminished or he sent locusts among the crops or he would send a plague in the land. In other words, when any of these kind of calamities would happen, the response of his people should be this. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, will pray, and will seek my face, this is the Lord speaking himself, then I will hear from heaven and I will hear their and I will heal their land. My ears will be attentive, my eyes will be open to the prayers offered by my people. So that's me paraphrasing Second Chronicles chapter seven. So how wonderful of a time is it for us to be in a section of scripture, the teaching from Matthew six, 
about how to pray. Now, we're not actually going to get into that section today. We're going to be in the section just before that. Uh, this is begin, the beginning of a longer section where teach, Jesus teaches us the right heart or the right attitude to have when we give, which is a major aspect of worship, when we pray, which is a major aspect of worship, and when we fast. And so we'll get into giving today and we'll get into the beginning of prayer. And this is all a lead up to me uh, to what is the climax of Matthew chapter 6, which is Jesus teaching us how to pray through the Lord's Prayer. Not to pray the Lord's Prayer precisely, necessarily, as wonderful as a prayer as it is, but using the Lord's Prayer as an approach to prayer. But before we get into that, uh, he, he continues with this teaching, which is much about attitude. You might say that the theme thus far of the Sermon on the Mount is how to achieve greatness or how to gain power ironically through humility, power through humility and authenticity and realness before God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, not blessed are the puffed up. It's the antithesis to the ways of this world um, we find ourselves is, is the ways of the kingdom of heaven. Anyway, Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, we'll begin with Jesus' teaching there. He says there to be careful not to do not to practice your righteousness in front of others. Righteousness would be good acts, spiritual acts, uh, religious acts, you might say. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Not that you'll have less of a reward, but you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. Now, there are many things we can do that are righteous things. We can be generous, we can be kind, we can be loving, things that we're inspired to do by the Holy Spirit and through our understanding of Scripture, things we're inspired to do out of love. And many times people will see it. And in another section, Jesus taught us to let our light shine before men that they might glorify our Father in heaven. So some of the good things we do, we do and other people see, and it brings glory to God. This isn't necessarily about the exteriors. This is about the motives. Now, you got to remember that Jesus is teaching his 12 disciples who would become, 11 of them would become the apostles. They would be um, the historical, foundational human leaders of the church up until this day. They wrote most of all the scripture, all the scripture that we have in the New Testament was under their sanction or their authority. And so these were going to be the next great spiritual leaders on the earth. The only um, people they had to compare themselves to were the teachers of the law, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the high priests a group they would, call, they would have called the Sanhedrin. And so it would have been very natural for them, under the teaching of Jesus, their rabbi, he was much more than that, but as far as they were concerned at that moment, he was teaching them much as a rabbi would his students. The only example they had was the old guard. And so Jesus actually used uh, the failings of the old guard as an example of what not to do. He was raising up a new spiritual leader, a new type of spiritual leader. He himself would be the model of that leadership. And he juxtaposed that type of leadership to the old leaders. And I think what we're going to see today is that he, had, he didn't have a lot of respect for their leadership because what he saw them do were acts of righteousness um, that, were, that were superficial, that were not truly inspired by the Spirit or the heart of God in many cases, and were done more to give them standing among people than to give them standing with God. They would do their acts of righteousness in a way to gain political power rather than to gain spiritual power. They would do their acts of righteousness in such a way as to gain the praise of men, people, perhaps uh, give themselves standing or, or, or cause people fear or some sense of, of awe at their power, maybe if they had any wealth or power or eloquence, uh, it would give them a sense of power with people, and they would, they would use this to gain political power. And what Jesus is saying is, that's not how we do it. That's not the way you're going to lead. You're going to lead in such a way as to appeal to God and not to men, to gain favor from God rather than men, and to gain your power from heaven rather than from politics or from people. Your favor, even with men, will come from God. Your authority will come not from men, but will come from God. You will be anointed, and that can't come from men. That will only come from God. And it won't just be that you do these acts, but you will do acts that actually bring people not closer to you, but closer to God. A major shift in, in spirituality during that time. 
And Jesus wanted to make it very, very clear that what they saw was not the standard. So he goes on and he begins by uh, applying this overarching statement in verse 1 to giving, to what you do when you give, especially, particularly to the needy. Now, at that time in Jerusalem, there were many needy people. There were many poor people. You might say a majority of the population was poor, but there was, you know, the super poor. And, And a normal religious act among the Hebrew people of that time was to give alms. And to give alms was to give to the poor. So when you give to the needy, when you give alms, a normal religious act, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, the favor they received, the prestige they received with people, uh, they have received their reward in full. Now, what Jesus is saying is, instead of giving these gifts to the poor as an act of worship to God, they're giving these gifts to the poor in order to gain worship for themselves. They're leveraging these gifts again, to gain political power among the people. They would do it publicly at the synagogue. With trumpets, may be a literal thing. It may just be hyperbole. It was just, they would do it at a time, an opportune time, when the most people could see it and the most attention could be drawn to it. And people would see their gifts and they would praise them for their gifts, but they would receive no praise from their Father in heaven. They would leverage these to bring people close to themselves. They would leverage these things to bring worship upon themselves rather than doing these things discreetly to bring glory and to bring honor to God and to really bless and to help and to lift up the people who needed the gifts. It was a, it was a, a really backwards way of thinking and doing things. Now, the, thing, the advantage we have in our culture and our time is even when we do this wrong, we know the right way to do it. Christianity has had such an effect on our culture that we understand that giving and doing good deeds in secret, being discreet about things, even though we don't sometimes, we understand that. We've had a Christ-like example in our culture, in the way that we think, in the way we do things for for many, many years. Well, during their time and in, in their place, that wasn't the case. It was typically those with wealth and those with some religious prestige that had most of the political power, and they would do things to draw people to themselves. Now, the major flaw of this, when we make this mistake, and we give to bring adulation to ourselves, is we give as if we're the source, rather than just an instrument of God. We forget that whatever we have, we have because God first gave it to us. How can we take glory for giving anything away that God first gave to us? But pastor, I worked so hard. I worked hard and I'm smart and I went to school and I've gained this wealth. And now I'm going to give it to this pitiful person who doesn't work hard. Like that haughty Republican, if you might say I'm a Republican, but that Republican attitude, that doesn't fly with God. The one who gave us health, the one who gave us wealth, the one who gave us an education, the one who brought us up in the nation with the opportunities we have, the one who sustained us, the one who brought all these confluence of events together for us that we might gain some wealth and have something to give, either in the form of money or otherwise. He is the source. And so when we give in such a way as to bring prestige unto ourselves, then what we're saying to everyone around us is we're the source we're the one you come to. We're the one you bow to. We're the one you worship. And that, that is an abomination before God. That is an insult to God. And so the Lord's like, fine, you want to do that? You want to give to people in that way? You want to be generous in that way to, to the poor or to anyone else giving of alms or whatever? And you want to draw that attention to yourself? That's fine, but that's where it ends because you'll receive no blessing from me. Again, the Lord is cutting to the heart of the matter uh, He doesn't play around with our religious ways. In verse 3, he says, But when you give to the needy, instead, here's the remedy to that. Now, probably the people he's speaking to again, the disciples, and and of course, there was a large audience there, but he was primarily doing a leadership training for his 12. Um, They probably didn't have a lot to give. And so he's preparing them to have a change of heart and, and a change of attitude and a change of lifestyle and to become generous, especially on behalf of the church. So when you get to that, when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In other words, purify your offerings through secrecy. 
so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, he'll reward you. Now, that's what we're after. We're not after the reward that can come through men. We're after the reward that can come from God. The, the reward of men, the praise of men, the loyalty of men, even the power that humans give us is just temporary and it's flawed and it's, it's, it's not as good. Whereas the favor and the authority and the power and the loyalty that comes from God begins on earth, it increases through time, and it lasts forever. We want the blessings that come from God. The, the help or the support of men is worthless. And so Jesus is saying here, you need to purify your offerings through secrecy. And, and really recognize that when you make an offering to the poor, you're really making an offering to God. In another place, Jesus says, as you do unto the least of these, you do unto me. How can we have a haughty attitude when all we're doing is worshiping God by bringing something back to him that he gave to us in the first place, and even that he promises to bless and multiply when we do. When we do this as an act of worship unto God rather than worship towards ourselves unto men, uh, it changes our attitude completely. And I think what the, the, the idea of giving to the poor especially is giving to the Lord, not to the person specifically, and giving to them in such a way as to lift them up. If we're going to lift up any human being in the transaction of giving, then we need to lift up the person that we're giving to. What we're saying to them is, you know, as an instrument of God's grace, by the grace that he's brought to me and is now bringing through me through the act of generosity, because of the generosity that began with him, I want to lift you up. I want to let you know that you are valuable. I want to let you know that you're not forsaken. I want to let you know that you are loved by God. I want to let you know where this came from. There's a lot more in the future. I want to lift you up and, and, and pick you up because, you know, the gospel is good news to the poor because the poor are the ones who know they need the grace. And many times it's the, the poor who need to be lifted up. There's no chance of arrogance with the poor because they're so diminished in their circumstances. And so giving to the poor, in a sense, is not just giving to God, but giving to God in such a way as to lift up those who need to know that they're valuable to God. And to do it in such a way as not to lift up self, but to diminish, to diminish self as a servant in the process. One of the things that we've experienced when we go overseas with Compassion International to, um, to serve the poor, as it were, is that uh, we, we recognize immediately when we get there. For, the first thing that happens is we go into one of these foreign countries where everyone is poor and we go to, we've made investments and we go to make further investments and they're not that much money, but they're a lot of money to the people that we invest in. And the very first thing we recognize when we get there is that, man, there is nothing to be prideful about. We feel quite humble. As a matter of fact, what we recognize is what the scriptures say, which is that God has chosen those who are uh, poor in this world to be rich in the spirit. And it doesn't take very long for everything to pivot and everything to change around and for us to recognize that we aren't the exalted ones. We are serving those who are being exalted. If there's anyone uh, that should receive more honor, it, it's them and not us. And of course, they treat us with great honor, but then we reciprocate and we treat them with great honor. And really, it's, it's, it's quite something. It's a quite humbling event. Um, this idea that we would give in such a way as to win favor is a very worldly idea. It's not the way the kingdom of heaven works. And this entire gospel of Matthew, really the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation, is teaching us how to leave the world, which is forsaken by God, and enter into the kingdom of heaven, even on earth, right? The world isn't the earth, a place where we receive the favor and the power of God. And our attitude in everything we do, and even the religious things, and I would say especially the religious things, such as giving, is absolutely essential to walking in that door. If you hear these words of mine today, and you're able to understand them, intellectually understand them, believe them and receive them, and abide by them, I want you to know that you've received a great gift. You've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, and you've been filled with the Holy Spirit. He's given you the ability to see and perceive the ways of the kingdom of heaven, and now it will go well with you if you can abide in them. Now we move on to prayer. And it's the same attitude in prayer as in giving. It's the same attitude in everything that we do before God. Even the religious things such as giving and 
Uh, prayer and fasting is the section we're going to be in today, but it's the same principle in everything we do. Everything we do before God, if we do it with the right heart, is worship before God. And this attitude, this humility pervades uh, all things. In verse 3, it says, but when you give to the needy, I'm sorry, verse 5, it says, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. That word hypocrite is interesting. In in the Greek, uh, it reads much like a play actor. Don't be like an actor. So when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they receive your, their reward in full. If we go back to verse 2, it says, when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets. Let's ch- change that a little bit, and then we'll go right back to where we were so that you can see this kind of in context, in words that maybe help you understand. When you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites who are the actors. Don't announce it with trumpets as the actors do when they perform in the synagogues and on the streets. If we go back to verse 5, when you pray, don't be like the actors who love to perform. They love to pray as a performance, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners. That's their platform and that's their audience, people, and not God. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Don't, Don't be like the actors. Don't act. Actually talk to God. Prayer is speaking to God. The actors came out with their pre-prepared prayers. And they would go to the synagogue. And they would go out in the street corners. And they would go where the people were. And they would go where the crowd were. And they would have these wonderful, flowing, eloquent prayers that they had worked on probably for days and for hours and rehearsed many different times. Just the way an actor would before they came out on the platform to teach and to preach to act, to do Shakespeare or whatever. There are many actors in the church. I pray that I'm not one of them. By the way, this is an incredibly convicting section for for pastors. The Lord doesn't want us to stand up here and act. That's why my prayer today was, man, I don't care if I say it good. I just pray I say it effectively. And I say it from my heart, and I say it from a place of deep insight and conviction and not from a place of play acting. And so he's saying, don't be like these actors who go to the synagogue to perform for the people rather than to speak to God. And they may have eloquence and the words may sound good and they may sound smooth and they may draw the applause of the crowd, but they don't draw the applause of God. That is not the essence of prayer, not even close to the essence of prayer. And you you can only imagine they would stand there and they would pray and they would pray so eloquently that the average person in the audience, what they had to think was, man, I could never pray like that. If that's what a prayer is, then the best I can do is come to the synagogue or stand out in the street and find one of these incredible religious leaders and and let them pray and hope that prayer landed on me because I could never pray like that. I am not that eloquent. I can't memorize things. I am not that strong in my mouth. I'm not that confident. And so actually the effect of their prayers prayed publicly, didn't lead people closer to God, didn't lead people to pray to God, very likely led people to think that they weren't worthy to pray to God. Now, can you imagine worse spiritual leadership? The the worst thing, this is pretty convicting for me, Uh, not really because I'm not that good at what I do, but the worst thing that I could do, this is my application, is to teach and to preach and to lead you spiritually in such a way, to pray publicly in such a way as you watch me and think, what he does, I can't do. Therefore, I'll listen to him do it. I'll enjoy the performance, but I won't even try to do it myself. That means I have provided zero spiritual leadership, and I'm playing for an audience, and I'm not playing for God. When the spiritual leadership, he was preparing them Um, for was so different and so new than what those had done before, where they lorded it over others, where they acted like they had all the authority and none to dispense to others, where people had to come and sit at their feet to to receive any authority or power or covering from God, is so radically different. And you got to, you got to put, this is a great teaching for everyone. This is a, a major teaching in the gospel of Matthew for every single person who follows Christ, because Indeed, in this day and age, we're not, it's not just Jesus teaching some people, some leaders. Um, it's him teaching all of us. We're the priesthood of all believers. I would say we're the prophethood of all believers. And so it, it's obviously important for all of us, but we have to remember, we have to put this in the context of what Jesus was doing is he was doing some leadership training. 
And he was preparing his apostles to lead others, and then he was going to prepare them to lead others as he had led them, and, and, and on down the line. And so, uh, what were they really doing? They were performing. I think Jesus made it very clear in many different places and many different ways, and he may have not been speaking universally about, about the spiritual and religious leaders of that time, but prominently, these people were doing this as this was their politics. This is their way of control. That's what religion is. When you're a religious leader, is not necessarily a spiritual leader. A religious leader is someone who binds the people up, controls them for political type purposes. We see that throughout history all the time. It gives the church so many times a bad name. I know so many people that won't come into the church because that's how they perceive us. And sometimes that's fair, and sometimes it's not fair. But that's what we've seen throughout history. And Jesus was like, no, we're doing something radically different. We're going to empower, not disempower. We're going to give power. We're not going to extract power. And we're going to do everything before God and not before each other. Horrible leadership. So he offers the remedy. He says, so when you pray or but when you pray, instead do this. Uh, this one's ext- extreme. Go in your room. Go somewhere private. This is where we get uh, that word room could actually be called closet. And this is where we get the little phrase we use um, in the church to go into your prayer closet. Go into your private place with God. Go into your room. Close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Again, purify it through privacy. Privacy. Just like you did with your gifts, just like you do with your offerings. Do your deeds before God. Don't do them before men. This shows that you believe that God who is unseen sees. And he rewards those who diligently seek him. Purify your prayer in this way. The audience that we're ultimately all playing before is the audience of one, the audience of God. Now, at such a time as this, in our, in our history as a nation with everything that's going on, But at all times, I would say, because we always have things that we're struggling with and we're dealing with, where we need God's help, we need his power, then praying in such a way as to receive the attention of God, where his uh, ears are open, his eyes are attentive, his ears are attentive and his eyes are open, is absolutely essential. It is absolutely essential that our prayers be effective. Absolutely We're looking for transcendence. We're looking for power from heaven to come upon the earth. Jesus and the teaching that we'll get into the very next time we're together begins right at the beginning, not at the exact beginning, teaches us to pray that his kingdom heaven would come to earth and that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven in and through our lives and all around us and upon us. We're seeking this transcendence, this authority, this power, these blessings, this wisdom that comes from heaven. It's essential that it be real. It's essential that it be effective. It's absolutely critical. It must be. I love where we are right now in this stripped down form of the church because if you're sitting there today watching the sermon, you must be seeking God because there's absolutely no social reason for you to go on the internet and watch a sermon and worship in the awkwardness of the moment unless you're really hungry for God because there's nobody to see and there's no way to be seen. It's not socially expected of you. No one's going to know. Everything you're doing, if you made an offering today, it was done in secret. If you stood and you worshiped today, it was done in secret. If you're listening with an open heart today, it's being done in secret. If you're praying today, it's being done in secret. It may be awkward, but it's secret. You're in your room. You're in your closet. The door is closed. The only one who sees you is God. What a great time to receive this teaching. And I tell you, the great thing about that is not just that you look good before God. It means that you have the attention of God, which means you have sought and found the face of God, which means you have tapped into the power of God. And indeed, now through this transcendence, through this openness, through this pleasure he has with you, you have the capacity not just to send up words and actions before God, but to receive words and power from him, transcendence. Now, that's another aspect of what he was preparing his disciples for in their leadership that the current leadership didn't know anything about. There was a period just before the ministry of Jesus of 400 years where the Holy Spirit or the presence of God, it, it was almost impossible to be found. 
They call it the intertestamental period, the, per- the, the period between the end of the Old Testament and Malachi and the beginning of the New Testament and the Gospels. There was a 400-year pe- period in history. They call it the intertestamental period. It was like the dark ages spiritually for the Hebrew people, for the world. God quit speaking. There weren't anointed kings. There weren't anointed prophets. There weren't anointed priests. The Spirit of God w- had gone, and, 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 and it ended with Malachi, and it, and it reignited with the prophet that we call John the Baptist, and then it continued through the teaching of Jesus, and then it has continued through history, through the body of Christ, in the wake of Christ. But there was this period where everything went quiet, and everything went dark, and they had the scriptures, and they had their traditions, and some of these were wonderful and very, very good, but all they could do is recite them. It didn't come with the richness of the presence of God. And so the prayers offered, these eloquent prayers offered, uh, they might as well just offer them to people because it didn't seem to ever make it into the presence of God. And and everything they did was based on tradition and memorization and religion and all of these things. And that's what's the nature of of their leadership. It would have been been silly for them to sit in their room and do it. They needed to do it before an audience to have a a purpose to it at all. I mean, it was just a, a very different dry spiritual time. But Jesus is preparing them for the day uh, when his spirit would come and it would anoint them from the least to the greatest. And in the old days, even when the spirit of God was, was working well among the people, there were very few that were truly anointed. Kings were anointed with power and wisdom and the ability to protect their people. Prophets were anointed to bring the word of God. Priests were anointed to be intercessors on behalf of the people of God. And at different times, at various times, in various ways, the Spirit of God would come upon certain people to communicate uh, through them on behalf of all the people in wonderful ways. But a time has come now through Christ, very soon, after his death, after his resurrection on the day of Pentecost, when he poured out the Holy Spirit and continues to pour out his Holy Spirit upon the church, where we will all know him from the least to the greatest. In other words, and we won't know him just in the sense we'll know about him, but we'll know him personally through the Holy Spirit. We are now not just you know, those who have priests who are anointed. We are the priesthood of all believers, all anointed. We are the prophethood of all believers. And though we don't have anointed kings, we are joint heirs with Christ the King, and anointed in that sense as well. And so Jesus is getting his disciples, who would lead others as he had led them, who would become our apostles, to enter into this dynamic, rich spiritual time where they might actually speak to and hear from, commune with, communicate with Almighty God. And he's saying, this can't come, this power doesn't come through prestige, this power comes through Humility, this favor, this anointing, this authority doesn't come through exalting yourself before men and playing for an audience of many. It comes by being exalted out of your humility by God and playing for the audience of one. Absolutely essential to be effective. And the nature of it, again, is not just you sending words up, but God sending words down. And the nature of that is actually quite deconstructing and humbling. It's best done in a quiet, and a private place. He goes on to say in verse 7, and this is phenomenal. And when you pray, don't keep on babbling like the pagans. Now he's not picking on the religious leaders. He's picking on the pagans, those that are superstitious and have no knowledge of what they're seeking. They're seeking something spiritual. They're seeking something beyond and outside of themselves. They're, spe- they're seeking some kind of heavenly power in ways that are ignorant. He's saying, you know, they think by begging you know, the gods or whatever, uh, they can be effective. And he's like, you don't, you don't have to do that. When you pray, don't keep babbling. Don't keep repeating yourself. Don't actually speak so much. Speak much less. If we pray with faith in a God that knows everything, then what do we really need to tell him? We need to pray. He desires that we pray. He desires that we pray in the right way. We do not have because we do not ask God, but we don't have to beg God. We simply need to go before God and open our heart, open our mind, open our life, and invite Him in. As a matter of fact, telling Him what's wrong in our life is probably futile. We really should be asking Him to tell us what's wrong in our life. It's like we go to the doctor because our hand is hurting, and the doctor is the one who has to diagnose exactly why we're hurting. And when we go before God, all we know is that we're hurting. All we know is that we're in lack. All we know is that we're, we're fearful or whatever our issues are before God. Many times prayer is driven by those needs. And, you know, 
Jesus is saying, when you go before God, don't babble. Don't try to explain it. Don't overspeak. They think that they will be heard because of their many words. You're not heard because of your many words. You're heard because you trust him and he sees your heart. And he knows that you have faith. Don't be like them. For your father knows what you need even before you ask him. This is phenomenal. This is Jesus speaking to men in the presence of many cleanly and clearly, effectively, how to have a relationship with their Father in heaven. Ultimately, theologically, it would require that he, the Son of God, die on the cross for their sins, his life for their life, his holy life, his perfect life for their unholy life, that he raised from the dead, that they too might even now, as you and I have spiritually raised from the dead, that he would ascend into heaven and that he would pour out his Holy Spirit. All these things were to come, but this was the teaching and the training that would be effective for them in the wake of that. And what he was saying was phenomenal. You're going to have a prayer life that isn't a performance. You're going to have a prayer life is just you simply speaking to your Father in heaven. I'm going to give you an outline, an approach, an attitude, a way to approach God. Not a legalistic thing that you have to say, that you have to recite so many different times in so many different ways, but just an approach, a simple and powerful approach to come before God, to effectively come into the presence of God And not just speak these things up, but be in a posture and a spiritual condition where he can speak things back down. He is now choosing the humble things to confound the wise. He's using the foolish things to confound the wise. He's using the poor to confound the rich. He's taking the least and then he's making them the greatest. He's speaking to these disciples in the presence of many. This was extraordinary and advanced teaching. Think about this. Jesus didn't hide it from anyone. This is the Sermon on the Mount, thousands of people on the hill be, listening to him teach his 12. And, and, and he's not hiding anything from any of them because ultimately this teaching isn't just for the leaders. This is for all of them. And, and that's what we get to exist in, in this day, in this place, in this space, in this time. And Jesus is preparing them for a prayer life that is real, that is authentic, where they commune with God as they communicate with God, one that is rich in the spirit and rich in power. And that was, that's extraordinary now, but it was even more phenomenal then because that's something they could not have imagined after 400 years. I mean, they did, not them, not their parents, not their grandparents, not their great-grandparents, not their great-great-great-great-grandparents had had this kind of connection and opportunity with God. But they did, and guess what? You and I do too. In Romans chapter 12, I'll close with this. In Romans chapter 12, the apostle Paul says, the best way to hear from God The best way to be able to know what God is saying to you, to hear, to believe, to receive, and ultimately to obey, to be able to test and approve his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The way to do that is to go before God as a living sacrifice, humble, submitted, and surrendered to God. Now, that is something to me that is most effectively done, not in church, Certainly not in the synagogue, which would be our church, not on the street corners, not before an audience, not your pastor standing on the platform before a camera, not saying that it's impossible to have effective deep prayers with other people, especially if they have that same posture with you. That could be quite powerful and effective. But maybe the best prayer is those that we pray in our D groups and our small groups and those that we pray, pray honestly and humbly with our husband or our wife and our kids and those that we pray alone and in, 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 in this posture, this humility where we close the door and we maybe even get down on our knees because it just puts our heart and our mind in the right place and we just open our heart and we can pray with all of our heart, thy kingdom come and thy will be done. Not just globally, but in the circumstances I currently exist in, in my life, in my times, in my ways, uh, come and speak your will. Let me know what you're doing. Let me know what you think. Let me know what you think the problem is. Let me hear from you and respond to you. There should be incredible optimism in the midst of that humility. To me, Second Chronicles 7 speaks of terrible and tough times, but then it gives a prescription. It gives the the way to receive the solution or the remedy to it through prayer, through humility, through seeking the face of God, through hearing from God, being responsive, turning from our wicked ways, and then praying with credible, incredible power. And so when we're being stripped down, when things are tough, when things are so tough and difficult that we're finally in that place 
that were willing to bow down and surrender and submit entirely to God, that's, that's a moment of incredible anguish sometimes, but it is also a moment, if we think about it, of incredible opportunity and optimism. Because we know that God does not resist such a soul. He draws near to the brokenhearted, and he gives wisdom, he gives words, and we know that his words, they're, they're a done deal. His words come with power. They never return void. They always accomplish the purpose for which they have been sent out. When you're in that place of brokenness, when you're in that place of not performing for the crowds, but just performing for the audience of one, going into the presence of God, knowing that you need him, and knowing whatever he says, his wish is your command, that is a very, very powerful place to be. And it sticks with the theme of this entire, of this entire teaching, which is receiving power through humility. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you that you spoke today through this very um, normal human pastor who is not superior to your precious people in any way. You called me to lead your people, not because I'm so much like you, but because I'm like them. You didn't call me to stand here today and to be eloquent. You called me to stand here today and be clear and to speak an effective word something that reaches people right where they are in their room with the door closed before their Father in heaven. I pray, dear God, that these words landed, that you took imperfect words and you made them perfect by the power of your Holy Spirit and you brought your people very close to you. And you gave them a heart to pray and to seek you, perhaps with an understanding they didn't have before, a deeper insight that they didn't have before. Lord, I pray that as Tan sings this last song and we close our time together in worship, that you would give your precious people the wisdom to, to close the computer or turn off the phone and just spend a few minutes on their own praying in just the way that has been described through this passage today. No time like the present. Lord, I pray that we would come privately to you. We would bow down. We would surrender our life, surrender our heart, that we would pray with great boldness that your kingdom would come and your will would be done in and through our life, through our circumstances, on earth, right now, in time, even before heaven. I pray that the grand finale of this worship service would not be this last song or this last prayer or the dismissal, would be, but would be the prayer that your precious people make in many different places, um, even at different times, dear God, where they receive from you a word that they can live by, that they can trust, that they can hold on to, that they can obey and receive you, keep your, and hear, experience you keeping your promises and pouring out your power onto them. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is Morning by morning, new mercies I see, and all I have need at thy hand hath provided. Great
Thank you for your presence today. I thank you that you meet your people exactly where we are. I thank you that you are faithful, that you say that all who come to seek you with a pure heart, that we will see you. So God, we just thank you so much for sending your spirit. And we desire to walk with you moment by moment in these next days. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks for being here today, guys. I hope you have a great week. Um, if you need anything, again, text us your prayer requests, any questions, any needs you might have. You can also email us, and um, we'll be glad to respond to that as quickly as possible. We love you. We're thinking about you. We're praying for you. And you may even get a phone call from me from time to time. I'm going to try to connect with you um, through the week. Have a great week. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. We'll see you next time. Thanks.